Hi, my name is Felix Simonis. I am a PhD candidate and core developer um, of Precise at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, today I'm going to present you what's new in Precise, uh, more specifically what's new since the last workshop. Uh, this time, however, I'll be joined by my uh, co-presenter, which is uh, Gerasimus Hodakis. And uh, this talk will be a two-part talk. So first, I'll be talking about the changes in the coupling library itself. And then uh, Gerasimus will continue about the changes in the precise ecosystem. So what is new in precise? Uh, more specifically, what is um, new in the precise coupling library itself. So let me start with uh, some quality of life improvements. First of all, we changed how uh, the Patsy RBF mapping functions and more specifically how it communicates its uh, state with the user. Uh, so uh, what we now introduced is uh, the as this part you see at the bottom, this message you will uh, see frequently when you when you use Patsy based mappings. And we uh, needed to introduce uh, more um, information that the user can act upon. So what we do is now is we first of all say, okay, um, what is the resulting state of the solver and how long did it take to uh, converge? And then also why did it converge? In this case here, it's uh, it did converge due to rel sufficient relative convergence. Then it also tells you the last residual norm, as well as um, the limits that are used uh, by the internal solver. Um, which leads me to this next part, which is the solver behavior. So up until uh, version 2.3, the so if the solver converged, you would see like an, an information log, and precess would, co would continue with the simulation. But now, if uh, but then if the solver diverges due to some reason, you would see an error log that would tell you what to do next, but it wouldn't tell you um, what you could do to prevent this. So it didn't tell you what the why the solver actually failed, and then precess would of course stop. And this could also happen later on in a simulation, and then you would uh, quite waste a lot of uh, computational resources. So we introduced this intermediate layer here. Uh, between the convergence and the, di the divergence, we introduced like the stopping state, um, which basically models that the iterative solver reached the maximum amount of, of iterations. And then it will show you a warning and uh, continue. So you will see that something went wrong. Uh, you will also see, due to the information that you saw before, that um, that you reach the maximum amount of iterations. And based on this, you can uh, take action. So you can fine tune, for example, the relative tolerances of your solver to uh, improve this, um, the system and make, make the, the solver converge faster or at all. Uh, talking about convergence, we also improved the readability of the convergence output. This was actually uh, user feedback so now um, we uh, we also so we have readable names in the header of our convergence log files. So you can see here, for example, this is an relative residual based on the forces. Um, then what we also did is uh, we introduced fixed uh, width for the, the various um, uh, columns here. So you have a fixed uh, width for the time step iteration as well as a fixed scientific format for the uh, residual. Uh, what, you can, what this allows you to do is to simply uh, do like a following trail here of the, the convergence log files or multiple log files, and you can keep track of um, the state of your, 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 of your simulation. Does it converge fast? Does it converge at all or, or similar? So next up are scale consistent mappings. Uh, in precise, we have mappings that you can define, and these mappings come with certain constraints. Uh, we always used to have conservative um, and consistent. Conservative is used if you want to uh, map uh, like conservative data, so forces or mass. And uh, consistent is used if you have uh, data that is already normalized, such as temperature or pressure. Scale consistent is basically the same as in consistent mapping. 
but it uh, also uniformly scales the output so that the surface integral of the input and the output um, are equal. And this is, for example, very useful if you want to map velocities whilst uh, conserving the flow rate. Another major change um, is the default uh, for uh, inter-participant communication uh, regarding MPI. So if you define an M2N MPI, this always used to use uh, the MPI ports implementation. And now we, and we change this to use the MPI single ports implementation. So what does that mean? Uh, MPI was always just an alias. Uh, in the background, we always use two implementations uh, for uh, inter-process, um, also inter-participant MPI communication. On the left-hand side, you see the MPI ports. And what the MPI ports communication does, it uh, first creates this primary connection in blue, and then cr creates a secondary connections, which are basically always end-to-end -end connections. So it creates a communicator, always between two uh, ranks of the two uh, different participants. This works, but it is uh, relatively inefficient. Um, that's why we also introduced this MPI single ports uh, functionality. This is actually quite an old uh, functionality, and it it's, uh, it used to be within Precise. This was developed by uh, by Florian um, Linda, and uh, what it, this basically does is it com it connects the two communicators of the different participants. Uh, due to implementation reasons, we still need to um, connect the create this, this primary connection uh, using uh, the ports system. Uh, but this should become faster, and it should um, and it sh shouldn't you, you shouldn't notice anything um, uh, bad due to this uh, change. We also fixed a very old bug. Uh, yes, this, this is six years old, and this bug this bug is about uh, the the state where you have an M two N connection, uh, which be, which uses sockets. Um, and you don't have an internet connection. And in this case, on some systems, this would uh, lead pre Precise to crash. And we couldn't figure out why. And finally, if we figured out why this is the case, it was simply that we configured Boost ASIO to do a name lookup based on the IP address that we, uh, that we use from, the, um, from the, the configuration file, which is, of, of course, nonsense. And the problem is it doesn't DNS or lookup, which doesn't really do anything. Uh, but uh, if there's no internet connection, no DNS server reachable, then this crashes. So finally, we uh, managed to fix this bug. Um, what we also did is we improved the memory usage of meshes. This is due to a very deep refactoring uh, where we also removed unused and unnecessary functionality from the mesh package. In general, this reduces uh, the heap allocations tremendously and improves data locality. So you will notice an, an improvement in the runtime, especially of the, initialize, uh, in the, of the initialization phase. Uh, we didn't measure this though, but uh, we will eventually. And uh, in, in terms of memory usage, uh, we reduced the usage of the, the pure mesh itself by 50% uh, across the board. Uh, so you should uh, notice this as well, especially if you use bigger um, point cloud based uh, meshes. Another interesting extension is the multi coupling extension. Um, you may be familiar with the tutorial case of the multiple perpendicular flaps in a channel. Here we have a single fluid participant that represents the flow in the channel. And we have two individual participants that represent the two flaps. So in this case, the fluid participant um, is the controller of this multi-coupling scheme. As it can see, both solid, uh, the solid one and solid two. Uh, this was extended, so now you can actually split, for example, you can split up this, um, this channel into two. So I have two fluid participants, and uh, now we don't have this centric participant anymore. Nevertheless, you can now 
also use an, a multi-coupling multi scheme and use, for example, here Fluid1 as the controller. The only limitation here is that, that uh, such a non-centric controller needs to run in serial. But uh, we'll try, we try to uh, remove this limitation at some point as, as well. We also adjusted the build experience. Um, so uh, from uh, presets version 2.3 on, uh, if you create uh, a source build and you just use CMake with no additional parameters or um, arguments, then um, it will create a shared library, which will work when you install it, etc., etc. You can also use it from the, the, the build directory directly, um, as well as uh, that this library will contain a debug and trace logging, uh, which you can enable, um, and it will contain assertions. So this is the safe library by default. It won't be fast. If you need something fast, you have to use the release build. In this case, um, it will again create an, a shared library, which will be optimized, and this will not contain debug nor trace logging, and also no assertions. Um, if you need these, uh, wait a bit, I'll come back to this later. We also added some experimental features. Currently, we just, we just have one, and uh, we took the decision to uh, force the user to explicitly enable these experimental features in the configuration file. So you have to you have to explicitly specify experimental true, and uh, then you're allowed to use certain API calls that are not finalized yet. As an example of this, we have the uh, direct access fun functionality. Here we have a participant, which in this case is called uh, my participant. And it wants to use, um, or your goal is to use a mesh from another participant, but without a mapping. So you would like to directly access this. So you can use um, the direct, uh, direct access specification here, I set this to true. And then you can normally, you can, you can uh, do this, the usual thing that you say, okay, I would like to write data to this mesh. How do you use this? Uh, well, yeah, first, you need to specify like the region of interest, given the, the certain rank using an access aligned bounding box. Uh, once you've done this, you can initialize precise. This will exchange the meshes. And then afterwards, you can inspect the received mesh. So you can uh, ask precise how big is this mesh, how many vertices does it contain. And then please, precise, please give me all the vertices, so the coordinates and the IDs of these vertices. And once you, you got these IDs, you can then write um, directly onto this mesh or read directly from this mesh, depending on how you configured this. So now we come to the upcoming changes, and these will already mostly be released in version 2.4, uh, which is uh, supposed to come out in a few months. So let's start with the bigger features. First of all, um, the first big feature was already presented in the workshop 2020 by uh, Benjamin Rodenberg. And this is about um, the higher order time stepping schemes. And this is, this is already public, so you can uh, watch his talk uh, using the following YouTube link, or you can go to uh, our YouTube channel. And on the right hand side here, you see that there is a, a, a talk planned during the developer talk se session, which will be on Wednesday uh, from 10 to 12, and it will be the third talk in this session. Yeah. Next up is a tool that will be especially useful for everyone who uses Precise uh, uh, directly and who uh, has to develop uh, adapters. So uh, currently, so uh, we will um, ship a tool called Precise Tools. And this will be, will be available out of the box. So install, if you build and install Precise, it will be available. And if you install the uh, Debian packages, it will be available. And this allows you to check uh, a Precise configuration um, without actually starting the simulation. Um, so what this does is, is it checks mostly basic things, uh, such as uh, the XML structure, so do you have typos in the tag names or attribute names or, or something, uh, things like that. 
And it, uh, which is more interesting, it checks uh, the names of participants' uh, meshes and data. So if you define, uh, if you have a typo, for example, in your data name, you use it in the mesh, then uh, it will complain. And so this, this is especially useful um, if you have to copy paste a lot and uh, just to prevent these silly mistakes. However, it cannot check everything. Currently, it cannot check um, more advanced coupling logic. And example for this uh, would be um, if data is actually exchanged by the coupling scheme or in the coupling scheme. Uh, things like this, it cannot check, but uh, maybe it will be able to check this in the future. However, this is already a good start to get your uh, configuration to a very good state before you actually start with the simulation. We also uh, did an exporter overhaul. And this was due to the fact that um, our VTK exporter, which is the only exporter we currently provide, um, behaves a bit inconsistent, um, which makes post-processing of the scripts a bit more uh, challenging. So if you define a VTK exporter, in this participant, for example, it will export its mesh um, depending on so in various formats, depending on how you run it. If you run it in serial on the left-hand side here, it will create a single VTK mesh uh, in the legacy ASCII VTK format. If you run it in parallel, it will create a piece. It will create like a parallel VTU file and various piece files for the different ranks. So as you can see, these are different formats. So what we did is we added two uh, new formats. We have the, uh, the VTU format and the VTP format. So and once an unstructured grid format, once a polydata grid format, um, a polydata uh, format. And uh, these will export VTU files, uh, not only in parallel, but also in serial, uh, same, uh, same as for VTP. So this makes scripting way easier. Yeah, also that sounds, this might, this might sound a bit trivial, but it is actually quite an, a neat uh, extension. We added a CSV exporter uh, this uh, exporter is re relatively limited. However, we added it so that you have at least some other uh, format that does not require ParaView to be post -press as a processed. This contains point data only, so it doesn't uh, contain any connectivity information. And um, it will create separate rank files. So you don't have, do not have this one file that you can load which contains everything. However, the main point of this format is that it is extremely easy to post-process. Uh, so you can uh, load this directly into R, Pandas, MATLAB, uh, or some spreadsheet software like Excel or so, and post-process there. Uh, post-process there, create your, your fancy graphs or whatever. Um, and uh, the, yeah, the main point of this is also that this is a very intuitive format if you use pseudo-coordinates. So if your coordinate system doesn't actually make sense, but it's more like an ID system where you try to map um, like mesh vertices from one, uh, from one pseudo coordinate system into another pseudo coordinate system. At the bottom here, you see how this header looks like. So you have individual components and these components are just uh, shown in columns. You can then also post-process this relatively simply. And here is an example on how to uh, load this in Python and build a single pandas data frame, which contain for a specific mesh name, uh, all the different time steps um, from all the different ranks um, of a parallel simulation. And finally, we now also have uh, extended release builds. And what this means is that you can, uh, or you will be able to uh, specify that even though you build in a release, you would still like uh, like assertions. You would still uh, like to uh, build to to have a debug log available or trace log available. So you now can specify this, and this is especially interesting for um, adapter developer that require an adapter that uses mesh connectivity. In that case, uh, debug builds are often probably uh, slow. And uh, using this, you'll get a, 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 re a release build that will be slower than normal release. But at least you have, uh, for example, the debug log uh, 
available, so you can use that. And this is uh, my section of the talk. I'm handing over to Gerasimus. Thank you very much, Frederick. Now let's find out what's new in the Precise ecosystem. The Precise ecosystem consists of the Precise library and everything around it. You may wonder what is around it. Actually, a lot. In 2016, there was the first Precise version 1 paper summarizing the work of all the previous years. And there you can see that Precise already had, uh, of course, a C++ API as a C++ library, as well as C, Fortran and Python bindings. The paper also mentions several adapters, which today we would characterize as adapter prototypes, mostly being used inside particular research groups. The years that followed played an important role in establishing Precise as a multi-physics ecosystem. In 2017, we had our first adapters. Most importantly, OpenFOAM and Calculix, which you may have heard of, and you have heard of because they are actually used for so long, as well as SSU2 and Codaster. The next year brought the first tutorials for, uh, the, uh, for the complete adapters that you see today, as well as a web-based tutorial. You may have tried this on run.precise.org. We also developed our first system tests, which I will talk about on my talk on Wednesday about testing the ecosystem. The year after brought again another wave of adapters, as well as the MATLAB bindings. Most importantly, you may have heard of the Phoenix, the Deal Tour, the Nutils adapters, as well as the very useful tool, the Config Visualizer. The year after, and this brings us now to, to the state of uh, last year's workshop, we released Precise version 2. We released our new website that we are very proud of. We completely restructured our tutorials and we now have a demo virtual machine with everything included that you can try. Since last year, apart from building up on, on this, uh, these changes, we now have also Julia bindings, a Dune adapter, and a first version of an Elmer adapter. As you can imagine, if you don't only provide a library that a user has to use as a programmer, but you really include batteries that people can start playing with, then the interest will grow. And this is also the, the view that we have seen um, over the, the past five years. GitHub stars have consistently grown as is expected, and today we are close to 400 stars. The visitors also increased. And here you see the unique visitors on GitHub. And you may be wondering why this is starting to go down. Well, it is starting to go down because then uh, the GitHub projects are finding their main purpose, which is to serve developers. Now, all the documentation have been used, have been moved to the new website, uh, which has already uh, accumulated quite some traffic. Then, we are also very happy to see that the community really embraces the forum on this course, and this is growing very nicely. You already saw that there are multiple components, and that's why we're talking about an ecosystem. They are also depending on each other. For example, the demo virtual machine contains all of these components, including the tutorials. To run a tutorial, for example, the flow over a heated plate that many of you may be familiar with, you need to start two simulations. You need to start a flow simulation on, on OpenFOAM and a solid simulation of the heated plate, for example, in Phoenix. And for this, you need the OpenFOAM and the Phoenix adapters. The Phoenix adapter also depends on the Python bindings, which are now maintained on a separate repository. And 
both the Python bindings and the OpenFOAM adapter directly depend on the precise library. That's why we essentially have multiple layers of dependencies. And I would like to see the ecosystem as a fresh onion that as a user, you, you mainly want to interact on the outer layers. So you have the website and the documentation that you visit very often. You may try this virtual machine. And as your needs grow, you go deeper. You try out some tutorials, then maybe you develop your uh, own adapter based on one of the adapters that we have. Maybe you use the non-core bindings or other auxiliary tools. And maybe you also have to deal with the core one day. And the core includes the precise library and of course the uh, API in C++, C and Fortran. Uh, which is compiled directly with the library. Let's now see some tutorial news. We have a new structure that you may have heard of uh, already last year. And we have a few new cases that were released uh, over the past months. What are tutorials? Tutorials are starting points for your simulations. And the idea is that you take a tutorial that already looks very similar to what you want to do. You run it. This way you also test your installation. And then you replace one of the two sides with your own solver. The first tutorial that you should run when you start using Precise is this Quick Start, which is coupling open foam, the solver most of you usually uh, want to couple and a toy solver, very simple in C++. All this documentation is built directly from GitHub. And if you find any mistake or you want to contribute anything, it is really very, very easy. You just click this edit me button and you submit a pull request. You don't need to be afraid about mistakes. There will be a peer review and we welcome every contribution. Now back to our tutorials, we actually have now 15 tutorials and if you count all solver cases that are prepared for you to run this this gives us 48 solver cases and this is becoming already a lot especially considering that you you can run each tutorial with several different combinations of solvers and we have structured the tutorials in such a way that in every tutorial you have not only uh, the, the usual files, for example, the precise config XML, but its solver case that you have is consistent with the rest, meaning that you can start this uh, case and before you even compile any other solver, you can just decide what else you want to, to run. Now, if you wanted to contribute your own case, the only thing you would need to do would be to add a directory here, for example, fluid dash my solver, and make sure that you're using the same variable names as uh, defined already in the precise config. This is a much more sustainable structure than we had before, and we have found that it works very nicely. You can also find several tools, for example, this clean tutorial or this uh, round scripts, which are stored now centrally in one directory. And you may have noticed that in the beginning, you may not know where to find these tools if you just copy the directory. Well, my advice would be to start your case directly in the tutorials repository and follow the same structure. Since then, you could also easily contribute the case back. Of course, if, you, if this is not something that you would consider, you can just copy the tools and maybe change the, the paths in these uh, scripts. 
This you already saw uh, last year, we had discussed it, but uh, not released, and we have released it now. And we also released a new version of the tutorials just last week. This new version brings us uh, a new case, a, a new complete tutorial for volume coupling, which I will show you in the next slide. It also brings, uh, together with a new adapter, uh, brings a case for Dune as a solid participant in the perpendicular flap. We have now also added open foam to our partitioned heat conduction tutorial. This is a custom solver based on Laplacian foam, as well as a Phoenix version of the Elastic Tube 3D tutorial. We have also uh, cleaned up several configuration files and we have now made an important change that you may want to also apply in your calculus cases, which is using a different type of finite elements, which actually improved our results a lot. As you see, there are several contributors in this release, and we are very happy to see that the contributors are increasing every year. So it would be very nice to also see your name there next year. I already talked about a new case, and this is the volume couple diffusion with two Phoenix participants. The one participant is a sink and uh, the other is a source. And we essentially have just two overlapping domains and we have some quantity which uh, flows from the, from the source to the sink, to the drain. Other adapter news is that we have a new adapter for the finite element code Dune. This is the result of Max Firmbach thesis and is already available on GitHub. It is also available directly on the Precise VM, so you can start uh, trying it if you want. As I mentioned already, the Calculix adapter is already uh, one of the first adapters we had and we were always maintaining one separate branch for its Calculix version. We now decided to, to actually make, uh, start making releases and the versioning system will be the version of Calculix and as a third digit, the revision of the adapter. Here, uh, we have uh, a lot of work going on in the past few months and this is mainly work of uh, Boris Martin, who also added Debian packages for the Calculix adapter for Ubuntu, so you don't need to, to build Calculix from source anymore with its dependencies. We have fixed some memory leaks that uh, some of you have reported. We hope that we have fixed everything. Please uh, have an eye on, on any other uh, open issues. And we have now enabled uh, multi-threading in the spool solver. In new Calculix versions, there is also support for the Pastic solver, uh, which is based on GPUs, and this is also now supported. In the Phoenix adapter, there has been a new reference paper by Benjamin Rodenberg, Ishan Desai, and the rest of the contributors and you can find it on SoftwareX. The latest version of the Phoenix adapter also brings several 3D extensions and as you saw we now have a tutorial with the Elastic Tube 3D running with Phoenix. There are a few additional changes to keep an eye on as they are, uh, they are already there and they are getting in a better shape in the next few months. First of all, we have new bindings for Julia. If you don't know, Julia is a programming language which is meant to be easy as Python and fast as C++. We currently don't have uh, any tutorials for this as we also don't have any particular uh, solver based on Julia to, to actually try out. And this is where you could actually really contribute 
if you if you are using any Julia based solver, it would be very nice to, to build something based upon these bindings. This is mainly work based on the bachelor's thesis of Pavel Haritenko uh, and the student uh, Eric Scheurer with the supervision of Ishan Desai. We now also have a first experimental adapter for Elmer and this adapter has been developed in the context of the master's thesis of Hisham Said under the supervision of Benjamin Rodenberg. There is still a lot of work to do in this adapter, but a first draft is there. And we know that, for example, colleagues in the uh, Leibniz Institute of Crystal Growth in Berlin are uh, waiting to, to use this adapter and also to contribute and I would really like to welcome contributions uh, there. Finally, something that is not an adapter but a tool that was always imprecise but is now becoming much more useful is ASTE. ASTE is an artificial solver testing environment where you can see, for example, how the mapping methods of precise uh, perform. There have been several contributors uh, over the past uh, few years, uh, but right now there is a lot of work going on uh, by Kursat Yurt under the supervision of David Schneider. A few additional outer layers that we should discuss, and they are actually quite important for you. First of all, we have the demo virtual machine that you are also trying in this uh, course. What is this? This is a virtual machine. It is prepared for VirtualBox and we prepare it and distribute it with Vagrant. Vagrant is a system that uh, is used to essentially start virtual machines and have some uh, additional features such as easy file sharing and uh, easy SSH access into the machine. This is an invaluable tool, not only as a demo ma machine for you, where you can try out Precise and just throw it away uh, when you're ready to just install the components you need on your system. But it is also an important, um, an important tool for us because we can use this as a, as a reference uh, when we are developing some component. For example, I may have uh, trouble running some uh, tutorial on my system, but this may be because something is wrong with my system. If I can test that it works on the demo virtual machine, then it is probable that it is working also for several users. This is also a nice way to to keep a frozen state of versions of components that work together. And this led us to the precise distribution. The precise distribution is nothing more than a collection of all the relevant components at a specific version to the versions that they are known to work together. And it is something that we can now also cite as data, putting it on a data repository such as Darus. This is the Dataverse instance of the University of Stuttgart. On the left hand side, you see where you can find this in the precise website. And in the middle, you see what we actually put on Darus. And apart from all the components, we also put a PDF export of the website so that you can have the documentation reliably in the years to come. Here you see that for the first distribution that we released uh, last year, so the versioning is year, month and revision, there have already been plenty of downloads and we have now a new version released just next week and it should appear on Darus soon. So our plan is that we keep releasing uh, 
a snapshot of everything once per uh, year or, or once per semester and put as contributors everybody that has significantly contributed in the distribution based on the previous uh, version. So this would be also a very good chance for you to, to get your name known to our community. Talking about citations, uh, we have a new reference paper. Technically, we have a preprint since uh, last September. This took us quite a while to write, and that's why you may have heard of it already. But now we have actually submitted it uh, to, to an open access journal with open peer review. And when you actually watch the stock, it should already be in uh, review. We have already incorporated the first uh, editorial feedback and we hope to see it uh, already online in the next weeks. Make sure that when you cite this, you also cite the status of the open peer review. And now that there are so many different resources to read and learn from, as well as many resources to, to cite when you, when you want to say that I'm using precise, you obviously have the question, what should I cite? Well, right now you, you are doing the right thing. Just keep citing the precise version one paper. This is old. Um, it is quite outdated uh, in many aspects, but this is what is out there. As soon as the version two paper is out, please switch to that whenever writing about precise. Even if you want to say that this thing exists as well as when you want to say that I actually used it. Something that uh, you may be overlooking sometimes is that we want you to also cite any adapter papers that we may have. I talked to you already about the Phoenix adapter paper. So if you're using the Phoenix adapter, please cite that paper as well as the repository. And uh, we are uh, working, we are in the uh, final writing phase of an open form adapter paper and uh, you, you may find out more more of these reference papers soon. Now where does the distribution come into the picture? The distribution is the perfect way to ensure reproducibility. This also includes the virtual machine so the versions are synchronized at least there is a there is a virtual machine version for every distribution version. And if you write in your paper, I used the components from the precise distribution version 2104, means that in 10 years from now, if um, VirtualBox still exists, which has been the case for, I think, decades now, you would be able to just get this box and rerun the exact same experiments. To wrap it up, don't miss, in this workshop, the talk by Benjamin Oekerman on the support program coming uh, right after, as this is now uh, our way to, to make Precise even more sustainable. Then uh, we also have developer talks that you may want to follow to find out what's new on specific features. And if you've not already heard, I would like to invite you to our summer meeting, as usual, uh, this year with the Precise Mini Symposium at the ECOMAS Congress in June, probably, hopefully, in Oslo. Now, how could we close this talk, if not by saying that there have been many updates, and we hope that you can uh, manage to catch up with all these updates and use the latest versions of Precise, of all the adapters of the tutorials. We try to not break things. We try to make it easy for you. And maybe you, you may want to contribute something so that you can be in the list of what's new in Precise next year. My name is Gerasmus Kurdakis. 
Thank you very much.